The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. and women of science and industry who have created a civilization enriched with a thousand and one comforts of daily living, and to their spirit that we shall lead in the march of human progress, this performance of the Cavalcade of America is dedicated. Cavalcade of America presents an original radio comedy, Dr. Franklin Takes It Easy, written by Eric Barno. A story of some of the amazing inventions of America's genial philosopher and beloved patriot, Benjamin Franklin, starring John McIntyre of the Cavalcade Players. Our Cavalcade Orchestra and the original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry presents John McIntyre as Benjamin Franklin on the Cavalcade of America. In his last years, Benjamin Franklin, one of the best-known men in the world was living quietly in Philadelphia. He was over 80, happy in the midst of his family and writing long letters to his friends. Every afternoon, his little granddaughter, Deborah, came into his study, for he would help her with her lessons. Grandpa? Hmm? Oh, come in, come in. What are you doing? I'm working on something. Is it an invention? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, aren't you wonderful, Grandpa? Is it a new invention? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll show you. Why, it's nothing but a long stick. Yeah, well, it has two prongs on the end of it. You see them? Yes. Now, they're the secret. What are they for? Well, I'll show you how it works. It doesn't look like an invention. It is, though. Now, now behold... Here, you see that book way up there on the top shelf? With the gold letters? That's right. Well, now, suppose I want that book. Shall I get you your chair that unfolds into a step Oh, no, no, we won't need that. Not now. But I like to see that work. That's a good invention. Ah, but, but look. Now, we, we hold the stick with the prongs right in front of the book. Like that. And then we go snap. Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 now it's just as if your old grandpa had an arm ten feet long. I just reach up the mechanical arm and grab a book anywhere I want. Oh, it's wonderful. You like that? Oh, yes. Are you going to make any more of them? Why, yes. I think I will. It'd be just what shopkeepers need. I'm sure they'll all want one. Then they can reach things from high shelves without any trouble. Yes. That's an idea, Debbie. We'll offer it to them. Oh, my. And, Grandpa, all the neighbors are using the chair that unfolds into a stepladder. Every house on the street has one. Indeed. And to think you invented that only a few months ago. (laughs) You're the most wonderful inventor. Uh, I'm not. You are, too. Everyone says so. And Mother says you're so industrious. Huh? No, I'm not a bit industrious. I'm just plain lazy. You are not. Yes, I am. I'm lazy. The laziest man you know. Why do you suppose I thought up this new invention? Other people don't mind walking up a stepladder six or eight times a day to get something off the shelf. But I hate it. Why, I'm so lazy, I invented a way of getting around it. Grandpa, how can you be so lazy if you work so hard? Why, just think of all those things you've made. All right, now, you think of them. 
I'll tell you a secret. I don't tell anyone, Debbie. I invented them all for the same reason. All to save me a little bit of energy. Why, I'm probably just about the laziest man in the world. Grandpa, I won't let you say such things. The very idea. Did I ever tell you about my very first invention? Now, there's a good example. Was it your Franklin stove? No, no, no. That came years later. This is when I was just a lad up in Boston. Did you invent something then? Well, sort of. One day, another boy and I had gone swimming in a pond. Big pond, about a mile wide, on the edge of the town. Well, we'd been at it all day, and we were plain tired out. Then came time to start home back to Boston. Well, we were walking along the edge of the pond, and I got to wondering how long it ought to take us to get home so we'd be in time for the supper. What Say, Ben, I wish we didn't have to walk all the way home. I'm stiff all over. Well, maybe a wagon will come along. Aren't you tired, too? Sure, Henry. I ache all over. Not a wagon in sight anywhere. Wait a minute, Henry. What's the matter? I have an idea about something. What? I want to fly my kite again. Fly your kite? Oh, what for? Come on, Ben, let's get on. No, I want to fly my kite. Look at that breeze. But let's get back to Boston. Oh, I'm tired out. You can wait a moment. Look at the kite shoot up. Look at it go. Oh, I don't care about that kite. Henry, hold it for a minute, will you? Now what? Just hold it. No, all right. That's it. I'll only be a second. What are you getting undressed for, Ben? Going to take another swim. A swim? We've been swimming all day and it's late. Oh, come on. We better be getting back or we'll get a caning. Here, Henry. Hold my coat, will you? I'm going into the pond. What are you doing with the kite? You'll see. As soon as I tie it around my wrist, then I float like this. Ben! Ben, the kite's pulling you along. Sure it is, Henry. Well, that's the idea. Hey, take my clothes with you. I'm riding back. Goodbye, Henry. Meet me on the other side. See, Debbie? I had it even then, my incurable laziness. <laughs> a lot of fun it was, too. Only Henry lost one of my stockings on his way back. Now, Grandpa, how can you keep saying you're lazy? Why, you made up so many good mottos about how people should be industrious all the time. Mm, I hope you've learned my mottos, Debbie. Oh, yes. We have them on our almanac at school. September was... Lost time is never found again. Mm -hmm. And October was the sleeping fox catches no poultry. Well, uh, uh, now, making up mottos is the kind of work I like. You don't have to get out of an easy chair for that. You mustn't say things like that. Remember what you did with those musical glasses in London. Oh, my harmonica. Yes, Grandpa, and your stove, and all your other inventions. Yeah, well, now, you take that harmonica, Debbie. I'll tell you about that. That's a good point. You see, I was in London once, trying to change some laws that weren't fair to the colonies. I wasn't very successful, but I did stay in a nice, cheerful house where an English family and their daughter looked after me. Well, they spoiled me, fed me tremendously, and I, I became the lord of the household. Well, one day we were having a jolly dinner. What was that noise? My mother, it sounded right in this room. Shh. So strange. Spirits, do you think? Well, it does sound in this room, but where? Maybe ghosts. I'm going to look in that cupboard. Well, mother, it can't be in there. Oh, where are all my glasses? Well, mother, what is it? My glassware, it's gone. All my best dinner. 
Where the glasses go? Oh, it's impossible. Oh, it's <coughs> the ones on the table, they must have been stolen. Uh, let me reassure you. Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, what have you been up to? Uh, let me explain, Mrs. Martin. You see this uh, glass on the table? Yes. Well, when the rim of a fine glass is wet and the finger is passed gently around the rim, we get... Hmm. Notice it's difficult to tell where the sound comes from? Yes, it seems all around us. And you were doing it under our noses. Notice further that this glass has a slightly higher pitch than the first one. <laughs> Why? Because it has less water in it. Now, where is all my glassware? Well, if you ladies will step into the next room, the concert is about to begin. <laughs> Mother, look at that table. All my 36 glasses in a long row. Now, ladies, you'll notice I have water at various levels in these glasses, enabling me to produce all the tones on the musical scale. Now, what would you like? A Scottish air? A minuet? <laughs> What amuses you? Mr. Franklin, are you going to run up and down that long table to play on those glasses? Have I eaten so prodigiously in this house that the very thought of my running is laughable? Oh, Mr. Franklin. Now, <laughs> well, it is a Scottish air. Uh, Mrs. Martin, your glassware is safe. Nothing will be broken. Well... musical instrument. But it was beautiful, Mr. Franklin. Let me sit down. Yes. Well, uh, I know what's the matter with it. I'll have some goblets made without stems and mount them on spindles to be revolved by a foot pedal. That's a much better idea. Okay. Then all the musician would have to do is to sit in a comfortable chair Operate the foot pedal and lightly touch his hand to each glass. Now, why didn't I think of that before? You know, Debbie, within a few years, they were playing the harmonica all over Europe. Why, they played it for the Empress at the court in Vienna. But it was all my allegiance. You are teasing me. What makes you think so? Debbie, you remember these funny spectacles I invented? Yes, what are they for? Well, I used to have to use two pairs, one for reading and writing and one for distant prospects. But I like to look out of the window now and then while I'm working. And it vexed me dreadfully to have to change my spectacles all the time. I was always putting on one pair of spectacles and taking off another. Well, I got so exasperated, I invented these. Those funny ones? Well, not funny when you have to wear them, Debbie. You see, each lens has two different focuses. The lower part is for reading... Up apart for distance. Now I don't have to change spectacles at all. My, I just don't understand. Grandpa, you say you're lazy, but I see you working all the time. You're always making something, and Mother says you used to spend just hours and days working on electricity. Well, now, Debbie, that's a long roundabout story. All those electrical bottles and batteries and everything? Well, I can explain that all right. Did anyone ever tell you about the electric Christmas party we had one year? No. Well, that's a good place to begin. 
One day, we invited our neighbors and friends for a demonstration. But it was also a party, an electricity party. (laughs) Friends? Friends? Since this is an electrical Christmas party, we shall roast our turkey by an electrical jack. Over a fire, we shall now kindle by the electrical bottle. Afterwards, a plum pudding with a flaming sauce ignited by electricity. Now, here you see our equipment. Doesn't it look dangerous? It is dangerous, madam. Extremely dangerous. I'd better step back there, young man. I want to be close. Uh, young man, it's a good idea not to be too intimate with this apparatus unless you've had a good deal of experience with it. I caution you all to be very careful not to touch these two knobs at the same moment. Uh, 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 what would happen if we did? Uh, well, I haven't experimented. It hardly seems wise. Get back, Tommy. Let me see, Mama. All right, we're ready to proceed. Now, the electrical fluid will leap from this knob here across this gap, igniting the tinder for our fire. But will we see anything? A flash of electrical fire. Now then, we take the other knob and carefully touch... Oh! Oh! Mr. Tyson! He's burning! Must have been the electric fire. Look at him, look at him. He's all blue. Mr. Franklin. Mr. Franklin. Stand back, everybody. Let him breathe. Oh, dear. His heart's still beating. I can hear it. Stand back, please. I want to see. Oh, he'll be all right in a moment, I'm quite sure. Uh, Mr. Franklin... Uh, Mr. Franklin, can you hear me? Mr. Franklin! This is what comes of meddling with supernatural things. Uh, Mr. Franklin! Uh, Can you hear us, Mr. Franklin? uh, Uh, Are you all right? No, friends, we take the knob. Uh, You've already done that, Mr. Franklin. That's why you're down on the floor now. Yes? Uh, Where am I? You're all right. You're just resting a moment. You've just had a severe shock. Oh, yes. You're all blue, Mr. Franklin. The uh, blood will come back in a moment, I believe. Uh, there was quite a flash, sir. Uh, such a noise. Don't try to get up, Mr. Franklin. Just sit there. Uh, did it hurt? Uh, what did it feel like? Uh, like like being struck by lightning, I imagine. Lightning. Uh, if I received a blow in every part of my body. Lightning. That's it. Did you say there was a flash? Oh, yes, sir. And, yes. and a noise like thunder. And smell that smell. You notice a sulfurous odor when the flash occurred? Oh, yes. Oh, I thought so. Similar to the one in the thunderstorm. Oh, friends, this supports a notion of mine that's been hounding me for weeks. If electricity and lightning really are the same, then we're on the verge of some knowledge very important. Now, forgive me for interrupting our electric Christmas party with this unseemly oh, performance. Help me out. Uh, let me out. Uh, it was a most vivid demonstration, Mr. Oh, Franklin. Oh, very exciting. And very. frightening. And perhaps not uninstructive. Lightning and electricity. There's a common connection there. And I'm going to track it down the next thunderstorm. Mr. Franklin... Yes? What are we going to do with the turkey? Oh, oh Tommy. Yes. Oh. Cook it in the usual way. <laughs> Hurry, son. The storm's coming closer. Be careful of the kite. But do we have to bring this? Of course. It's the basis of the whole experiment. I just hope none of the neighbors see us. Why, what's the matter? Flying a kite at your age? They'll think that we're not right in the head. Well, don't worry so much about people's opinions, son. It may prove something today that philosophers throughout the world are trying to learn. Uh, Turn here into this meadow. It's starting to rain. All right, let the kite up now as quickly as you can. There it goes. Flying up fast. All right, we're going to that shed there. I've got the apparatus all ready. I want you to take care of the kite, son. Here, give me the end of the line. I have 
to attach this key to it. Right. Now, if, if we get a spark there, does that mean that lightning is electricity? Exactly. Is the kite far up? Yeah, yeah. All right. I've got the key attached. There's a large thundercloud coming over. Good. Anything happening? No. No. That's a great cloud. No sparks yet. Maybe that the line isn't wet enough. Why, what, what would that do? Well, the string is not a conductor, but water is, so the string won't conduct the electricity until it's thoroughly soaked. Hey, look. See? What is it? The strands of hemp are standing on end, bristling up. Look. Sparks. The electric fluid's flowing through. We've proved it, son. We've proved it. I guess you remember the rest, Demi. Once I'd proved that, I knew how to save thousands of people's homes and churches and public buildings from being struck by lightning. Lightning rods. Lightning rods to conduct the electric fluid into the ground. Did you invent the lightning rod out of laziness too, Grandpa? Of course, of course. You think I'm joking, don't you? I don't know. Well, I'm not. Not exactly. With lightning rods, I made a lot of people's lives safer and more comfortable. You know, I organized the fire department here in Philadelphia. Whenever any home was struck by lightning, we'd rush out with our leather buckets to try and save lives and property. Often too late. Now, when a thunder gust comes in the middle of the night, you wake up for a moment and think, Hmm, doesn't that sound good? And then you can go back to sleep again, don't you? I like to hear it thunder when I'm in bed. Mm, most people do, nowadays, because now they're safe. And so I did my bit to help everybody be a little lazy. You don't really mean lazy, do you? <laughs> you understand. Yeah, I thought you did. You know, I think... People are very important, don't you? You're important. Everybody's important. Much too important to well, spend their time climbing up and down ladders all day. Why, that kind of thing makes a man a slave. And he's not a slave, Debbie. Because, well, man can invent things to do those jobs for him. You mean you can, Grandpa? Well... Debbie, in all my inventions, I was trying to make man free of drudgery. To give men freedom. That's the important thing. So they could go on and make a better world. Well, Grandpa, if that happened, nobody would have anything to do. They'd all be like the princes in the storybooks. They'd be better than princes. They'd be masters of everything in the material world. Yes, I believe that. I believe that. Well, now it's time we got around to your lesson, isn't it? Well, if you like. Now, what do we have to do today? I have to spell words for my New England primer. Mm -hmm. Let's see that list. All right, let's hear you spell some of these words. Ah, now, here's one. One of my favorite words. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? That's easy. T O M O R R O. A jack of all trades, a master of all. A brilliant mind that immeasurably enriched our American way of life. An amazing genius for invention dedicated to freedom and to the prosperity and happiness of our nation and its people, for which he labored all his life. The most American of us all, Benjamin Franklin, the many-sided genius, 
in the Cavalcade of America. The Cavalcade of America thanks John McIntyre and the Cavalcade players for their performance of Dr. Franklin Takes It Easy. And now, Ray Collins of the Cavalcade players to tell you about next week's program. Ladies and gentlemen, next week the Cavalcade of America presents a radio play, Henry Clay of Kentucky. The story of the man remembered for his great slogan... No south, no north, no east, no west. And who said, I'd rather be right than president. Admiring any man who fought for unity in America as he did, I am happy to play the part of Henry Clay when Cavalcade comes to you next week. Thank you. Part of Deborah on this program was played by Sarah Fussell. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.